Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the uh, final oral exam by, by Dinoglu. Uh, we are complete in the sense that uh, I saw Michael Poza, so I saw George, I saw, I saw Zach Manchester, so everybody who should be at this exam is uh, present. And so I will ask you, Arp, to start with your presentation and then we'll follow it uh, with questions. All right. Thank you very much, my friends. Uh, so title of my talk is Control of Multi-Contact Systems via Local Hybrid Models. I'm sort of interested in robots being out there interacting with the humans or other robots and doing interesting tasks. And uh, towards this, I will try to emphasize the importance of using this local hybrid structure. Oops. So I want robots to be really out there and they can be really helpful in Letter of tasks. For example, one of them is caring for elderly people. And, <laughs> and then the other one is, for example, tasks in the kitchen. You can see like these are really recent articles. And if you look at uh, these articles really carefully, you will notice that we are actually way off from achieving some of these goals. We are not exactly there yet. But on the other hand, uh, you would see that for many of the uh, applications mostly on locomotion side we have been getting like more and more impressive results you can see here atlas doing backflips or enable climbing stairs easily so it's not like we have the robots have not been evolving they are doing amazing tasks but i would claim that uh, this is mostly the improvement has mostly been on the locomotion side and manipulation side is still a little bit lacking for example if you look at these tasks here which are really contact rich and it's really hard to imagine sort of your robots uh, doing these tasks. And one reason I think uh, that this is the case is that these objects are really different. Like when you want to do a manipulation task, the object have a, might have a different size, different shape, different geometry. It's sort of hard to reason about the uh, size and make a different plan. And also another important point is the way you interact in the manipulation task is really, really like can differ from task to task, right? Basically. And through, through all of these examples, you can see that um, uh, the, main, the main challenge is like, you don't really have scalable algorithms that can reason about this contact interaction and can, that can like achieve this control through contact, specifically for this like challenging manipulation tasks. And the goal of my talk, I want to focus on improving the capabilities of robotic control to sort of move towards at least one step towards this direction. I will talk about three main goals that I want to, sub goals that I want to achieve. One of them is going to be planning through contact. How can you do planning if, if you have this kind of a multi-contact problem? The second goal is going to be about designing probably stabilizing tactile feedback controllers. And my third goal is going to be, if you have a learning-based controller in such a system, which is quite popular nowadays, can I actually do stability analysis of these systems that are enclosed with, let's say, learning-based neural network controllers? And to achieve all of these goals, I will focus on the theme of exploiting the local hybrid structure of the problems. In all of these goals, I will actually uh, try to tell you the story that like, using this local hybrid information can lead you to scalable and nice algorithms. But first, let's, let me just take a step back here. Uh, let's consider this uh, continuous time example where like, your robot arm is, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say continuous time, this example where your robot can move freely in the space. There isn't really contact. <laughs> this case is really well studied. Oops. So there are some connection problems. I apologize for that. Hope everybody can still see the screen. Um, so can you see this? I guess the zoom has no problem. You might see <laughs> Sorry, we kind I of cannot, I cannot can see the robot moving. I can see it, but. It's, it is not moving, but the connection to the projector is lost, so people in the room cannot watch the slide right now. But it, it, it's okay with me. I watched the stuff before. It's in the room. I watched your slides before. We, we have a problem with the connection yeah. in the room. How is this? You can see the slides, right, on the Zoom side? I can see the slides, but I cannot see anything moving. But don't worry about me. I have, uh, as I said, I looked at the presentation that okay. you sent me, uh, yes. so I've seen. 
it, it, it will keep going. The problem is mostly on the in, in the room, but I will keep going. Apologize for that. So the, the main idea was like, I wanted to take a step back and focus on the case where there is not really contact interaction. Your robot moves freely in the space. This is a really well established setting. And we have powerful tools for such cases. What one thing you can do is you can pick an operating point. You can linearize your system around this operating point, right? And after that, doing this linearization, there are plethora of control tools, such as LQR, MPC, or you can do like any frequency domain like PID design. And you can achieve a result you want, right? So doing this linearization simplifies the system, but also it gives you access to a, a multiple strong tools that we have really well analyzed. Now I will just throw a box into the setting. So now my robot cannot move freely. It, it also wants to accomplish a task of moving a box around, right? And now in this case, let's analyze the, this setting. You have two modes. I'm making a really toy plot here. Your X dot, you can think of it as, let's say, the velocity of the box. And whenever there is a contact interaction, no contact interaction, box is staying still, you can see from the plot. And when there is a contact interaction, let's say box is moving with some velocity. And if I do the same analogy, if I do the linearization here, I pick an operating point, I linearize the system, and you can see that my linearization only tells that the box is going to stay still forever, right? Which is the, the reasoning for this is that the linearization is local to a single mode. Once you do this linearization, you lose all the information about the neighboring modes. So you cannot really decide on how to touch or if you want, if you, you cannot decide on touching the box, for example, if you want to push it around using this linearization because it is local to a single mode. What you could do as an alternative with what we will focus in this thesis is a hybrid version of the linearization. So in this case, what I'm proposing is sort of this piecewise linear structure. It's not like we are not just picking one linearization, but we are almost picking a linearization for each mode, roughly, right? And what you end up after doing this is the system on the right side, which is called a linear complementarity system. Here, you can think of this system as sort of representing the mass matrix, Coriolis forces, the geometry, the phi, the geometry and the contact Jacobian information of the system. And I will now go through uh, the properties of the, like explain the system a little bit more in detail. But the main idea here is that this hybrid linearization can capture this mode, mode switching information. So if you plan with them, you can actually achieve a positive result unlike a simple linearization. So I will just now do a brief review of sort of the rigid body mechanics and linear complementarity systems here. So first of all, uh, my uh, lab mate, Matt, Matthew Palm, has done amazing work in this area. If you want really more detailed uh, uh, description of these. I love your list. Okay. It drives me crazy <laughs> when I read these papers full of all kinds of esoteric, <laughs> excuse me, Greek letters <laughs> that I cannot understand and they don't have explanation. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. So. So um, my lab mate, Matthew Palm, has a really detailed discussion of these. Uh, but for now, I will just give a brief introduction. So the first equation, so and I want to emphasize, this is like sort of roughly how under the hood your rigid body simulator works, right? You have one equation, which is the f equals ma. This is here, m is the mass matrix, c is the Coriolis forces. And potentially, the ones that are more unfamiliar to people would be lambda n is the normal contact force, and lambda t is the tangential direction of the contact force. And these Jacobians are mapping the forces to this generalized coordinates in this case. And the way we represent these contact forces are uh, through these inequalities. That's how we represent them, and inequalities, of course. So this one is saying that the contact force is always positive, which is saying that uh, this is, I guess, self-explanatory. The second one is saying the gap function, the distance between the objects. Sorry, I need to move this a little bit for you to see. Uh, the second one is saying that the gap function is always positive. And the third one, the orthogonality means their product is zero, which means there can be no force if you are not touching, basically. Are you considering two objects, hard surfaces? Yes. Not soft. Not soft in this case. But we, we actually, in, in the work, we actually also tackled soft contact models. For the sake of exposition, I didn't go through everything, but you can have a soft contact model. Oops. And the way, you, the way you describe the friction, the tangential forces here, will be through the Coulomb friction. These are sort of the rules you could get from your like, high school physics class almost, that the tangential friction is bounded by mu, the coefficient of friction, times the normal force. And if they're sliding, 
the tangential force is opposing the direction of the sliding, it's scaled by this mu times lambda, the normal force, right? Mm -hmm. And after representing this rigid body simulator equations, what we do is we take them and we linearize the smooth components here, like the matrices, um, inertia matrix, and also the geometry. We linearize the geometry too, like the Jacobian, the phi, but we keep this non-smooth structure intact. So what we end up after doing this linearization of each smooth component is a LCS, complementarity system. And complementarity systems are extremely well studied in the literature, like in the controls community, in the optimization community, applied math community, all of this applied mechanics community, all of them actually have been using some sort of a complementarity system under the hood. Uh, it consists of two different equations. First one is the dynamics equation, uh, and the second one is the uh, linear complementarity problem. So the dynamics equation is like regular to, in this case, discrete time systems you are familiar with. But there is one lambda k, right? That's not explained how you find it. The second equation describes how one can find this lambda k here, solving this optimization problem called LCP, linear complementarity problem. Again, it's really similar to the discussions we had before, so I will not go through it super detailed way, but the way you would like integrate the system forward will be given an x and u, you will find lambda, plug it in, in the first equation and simulate forward, right? So these are the basic building blocks we will use in this thesis. And I also want to talk about sort of equivalence between different hybrid dynamical models. What we are using here on the top, you can see as linear complementarity system. I have highlighted it in blue. There are two other classes I want to focus on here. One of them is mixed logical dynamical systems. These are systems where there are this zero one binary variables. And the last one is maybe the most familiar one to everyone is the piecewise affine systems, which are piecewise affine functions over polyhedral partitions. I would say this is the most commonly known one uh, among uh, the community. Uh, and this, this graph is a really nice graph by a paper by Hamels. Here, what they are doing is every edge in this graph tells that you can represent one system as the other one. So the tool says that here, complementarity system can be represented as a mixed logical dynamical system. But you can also, if you look carefully, you will notice there are some stars. The stars are the assumptions here. So for example, if you have a complementarity system, unless you have a boundedness assumption, if you have impulsive contacts, let's say, you cannot go to the MLD framework now. And maybe the more important one is that if you have a mixed logical dynamical system, if you don't have a completely well posed system, this means that given a state and input, if the, everything in your system should be uniquely determined, let's say if you have binary variables, they should be uniquely determined in this case, or select variables should be uniquely determined. You cannot move from MLD to piecewise FI. And here, the, the reason I wanted to discuss about this is, uh, oftentimes I refer to the complementarity systems as piecewise defined systems, but they are not exactly equivalent. They are subsets of each other, right? Sorry, they are not subsets of each other. But I think uh, usually I, I, I refer to them as like equivalent as piecewise FI for sake of simplicity. But I, I just wanted to clear, clarify that uh, for example, frictional contact systems cannot be really turned into piecewise FI, right? But there, there is some close connection. For example, Rugina asked earlier, the soft contact models can be represented both in the piecewise FI and complementary framework. In that case, they are equivalent, for example. Okay, so now I want to jump into the planning framework that I will present for this type of multi-contact systems. The problem I want to solve in this case is minimizing a quadratic cost subject to the hybrid dynamics. Here, I will denote things with, that are hybrid with red, so it's easier to follow. And first, I want to talk about what's out there uh, uh, that solves this problem really well. One of the first one I want to mention is a really nice work by Simon Taylor and Zach Manchester. They have uh, proposed this really nice algorithm that tackles multi-contact problems. They focus more on locomotion in their setting, in their experiments, but it's a really impressive work. I would suggest people to check it out. The second one I want to mention is the work by Damien Freak, by also Manfred. Uh, this is a work that really focuses on piecewise affine systems, primarily, not necessarily complementarity systems, but it's also impressive. They get some uh, really lo local optimality guarantees, and they also focus on this sort of operator splitting methods that are cl close at heart to what we do. The third one is the work by Yuval Tassa, Tom Erez, and Emo Todoro. They have done this in 2012. It's a DDP-based framework, and I, I will say they get really impressive results in 2012. I really uh, like their results. But the, the thing there is like they didn't really push their method to work on hardware. They haven't really demonstrated uh, strong hardware results. And the last one uh, I want to mention is 
uh, ADMM based algorithm, not for multi contact problems, but in general for non convex problems like this. This was the first algorithm I tried when I wanted to solve this problem using our ADMM type of approach. It doesn't really align well with the uh, uh, multi contact structure, but uh, the algorithm is really interesting and works for well for many non convex problems, and it was a big inspiration for our work. So, after talking about the previous works, I want to emphasize what we want to achieve. We want to uh, come, up, come up with this algorithm that can solve this problem with a substantial prediction horizon. These are sort of our requirements and goals when we are designing. Uh, the reason for this is that um, we want our algorithm to come up with interesting strategies. So if you are too close, if you look at too short of a horizon, you cannot, for example, come up with strategies like gating or uh, vaulting in this case. Uh, also, we don't want to assume any sort of nominal or current mode because you might have an offline trajectory, but things are usually going to go bad and you want to be able to recover when things are going bad. You want your algorithm to decide what it should do, even if there are, uh, if it bumps out of the mode sequence. And third thing I want to emphasize is that uh, we want the algorithm to be able to run at real time rates here. That's like the, one of the most important problems. And here the results I'm going to present are, the, these are the first real time MPC framework results for multi-contact manipulation. And what I mean by that is shown on hardware with like reasonably high uh, dimensional problems. Okay, so let me now get into the details of the algorithm a little bit. So our goal is to solve this uh, optimization here. I actually wrote the exact problem statements. You can see the complementarity system represented. So the way we get this is given a state and input, we get a local approximation here of, in the form of LCS. And then we solve this problem. This is how the process works. And it consists of three main, two main steps. One of them is solving quadratic programs. And then after quadratic programs, we will be solving projections, which are in, it can be in the form of mixed integer quadratic programs or linear complementary problems. So this is like the high level how things work, but I will now give more detail on how the algorithm works. So first step in the quadratic programming step, what we do is we get rid of the complementary constraints. So you can see, I don't have this hard uh, non-smooth constraints anymore. What I have is a simple QP. It's almost equivalent to a linear MPC. And after I solve this problem, uh, what I get is some not points, x0 to xn. Uh, but these are actually violating the contact constraints simply because we got rid of the contact constraints when we are solving this. So these not points are not satisfying the contact constraints. Then what we do is, one by one, we take the first not, zero not points, and then we find the delta zero that's closest to the not point, but satisfies the contact constraints. And we can now do the same for the first not point, right? And you can keep repeating this. You always find the delta that satisfies the contact constraints, but closest to the point you, not point you found. And at the end of the day, you end up with these uh, deltas that satisfy the contact constraints. You feed them in your first QP, and you iteratively repeat this uh, problem, uh, solving this problem. And important point is here is the following. As you can see, I can do this projection step separately for each not point. So I'm making really small scale projections and I, they are totally parallelizable and decoupled. So this hard part of the problem is decoupled in the horizon here, if you can see the, in the horizon end. And I want to give some numbers here that if, because we are doing this decoupling in the horizon, the original problem, which is an MIQP and it's hard to solve, but gives you optimal solutions, has like, let's say, worst case complexity, roughly, I plug in some numbers here, like roughly a million. And using our method, because now it's not exponential with the horizon, but linear with the horizon, you get something around 200. But I want to be clear here, MIQP, the, the left side is the optimal solution. What we get is an approximate solution. And, and also, I want to emphasize that the, you see some number S there, which is the number of iterations, how many times you run one and two sequentially, one after the other. So that is a number we also pick here. In this example, uh, numbers I gave, the five was a good working example. This is from a real example. So here, roughly, the complexity scales uh, is roughly like 200 compared to the million in the global optimal case. But uh, again, to emphasize, if the solution on the left side is better. It's global optimal. What we are doing is actually suboptimal but faster. And here, the key insight is the, that we decouple the contact scheduling over time so we can get the speed up. And how guarantee stability there is no stability guarantees here huh there is no stability guarantees in this work there is none none for this one none. okay that was my question feasibility there is not even a feasibility guarantee yes because one of the big issues in hybrid systems and 
Ram Vasudeva worked his to guarantee that when he switch, it is the switching function, uh -huh. the switch that it will not oscillate. Yeah, so so for this work we have no no uh, stability guarantees. For the feasibility side, you can always take the inputs you get from your uh, solution and simulate it forward. So you have a feasible solution at the end of the day. But it's not a good like it, it, I guess like you can always get a feasible solution given a set of inputs because you can forward simulate it, if that makes sense. So like you will get something feasible, but it might be much worse than the cost you get from your optimization. If that makes sense. That's that's maybe that's Michael. Yeah, that was maybe Michael. And, and there will be next the next section we'll talk about these okay. stability guarantees. But this section is real time. Okay. Okay. What do you mean next section? Next, the next the, part of the talk. Next part. Next part. I'm going to talk a bit more about stability. But for this work, there is now no stability guarantee. I see. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I want to now talk a little bit about the uh, hard, hardware hardware setup and the uh, generic framework. So C3 is our controller, but we proposed. Uh, it gets a state estimation in this test from, oh, uh, sorry, apologies. I first need to mention that the test we want to do in this case is moving the object, in this case a sphere that you can see on the top right, and I shouldn't hide Adam's face here, uh, top right, that we, we just want to move this sphere around. What we do is uh, uh, we get some state estimation. We have a proper reception around one kilohertz rates. We get the vision position tracking of the object around eight kilohertz rates. And these informations are fed into our controller. Our controller gets the state information, makes a local LCS model. Each step, it makes a different LCS lo local model, like, like people successively linearize. We do like the different LCS approximation for each state. And then makes a plan using a simplified model. So when I, what I mean simplified is, in our, in our controller, it thinks that the end effector is a floating body. Here, the red, the red, red, red thing there, you can see is the end effector of the robot. So the reason we are doing this is we want to decouple this com nonlinear complexities of the robot from our hybrid and PC probe. And after that, our controller produces a desired state and contact force pair, which is fed into an impedance controller. And you can see now this impedance controller is following that red, red ball in the previous figure. And it already is like achieving the task you can see here. This is like the generic setup. And uh, I want to now show like some of the results here. Uh, it's that. Um, here, uh, this is like real-time MPC. There is no offline computations here. And I want to also emphasize that only thing we tell as a cost functioner is like move the ball from A to B, and we give a circular path. And you can see it, it tracks, in this case, reliably now. It can even bump uh, out of sequence, but it kind of recovers. And we also have done uh, some other interesting results. The left-hand side is disturbance rejection. It's basically me poking the ball with a stick. Uh, and you can see it, uh, even, even though I'm poking, it catches it and like it decides on the go. And on the right hand side, you can see the uh, multiple objects case. So here, one of them is like it's manipulating two balls at the same time. In both cases, the ball is moving the balls towards left. And right hand side is moving three balls. Oh, and the, th the right hand side, actually, the three ball case uh, is running uh, half real time. So that's one thing I should, I should mention. I was going to add that, but I forgot. OK. So now we talked about a case where we had like good uh, identification of the model parameters. Now I will try to sort of extend this and ask the question, what if we, some of the model parameters are wrong? In this case, for example, you can see already in hardware, when you have a ball model that is bigger than the actual ball, it thinks it's touching the ball, like uh, and it's failed. Like bigger in hardware, you can easily see this by adding a half centimeter gap uh, error in your ball. It thinks it's touching the ball, but it's of course skimming over it, right? So and the question we are trying to answer is here is what can we do in this setting? So OK, uh, we have the similar framework to what we have done before, but we have added this residual learning module. This module is running at 20 hertz, right? It's getting this vision data from the object. And oops, apologize for us. So again, no. All right. So this residual learning framework gets the state data, which is vision data from uh, the object. And uh, from Franca, it gets like uh, this one color state estimation data. And it's, it's going to do some updates on the LCS model. You can see it on the top left, denoted by the red letters, D residual and C residual uh, values. What we are doing is we, we have like a buffer that gets 10 data points and quickly updates this on the go. That's like the ba basic framework. And 
This is like uh, at heart is closer to adaptive control, but we have used the uh, novel loss proposed by our lab mates uh, here. It's a violation based loss. And the only thing we did in this framework was like moving from sort of this model learning area where you have a lot of data to a setting where you kind of do this real time updates quickly in an online manner. Any model? I mean, if, if the question is uh, asking like if this could capture it, it's, yeah. it will be hard to answer. I, I, I should try it first. It will be, I think I will be like. Because that's exactly what happened yeah. when you walk. Uh -huh. right? yes. yeah. Yeah, it, it would be, I would say, hopefully, yes, the LCS models could probably capture something. Could you, could you repeat? Could you repeat the original questions? I, I didn't quite uh, understand it. Uh, you know, I was asking, can you sort of uh, model learning with this type of frameworks? Okay. Well, no, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, uh, my, my apologies. Yes. <laughs> him, him yeah, yeah. I, I missed him as I missed him. So the question whether you could model walking. Yeah. The, the foot fall okay. of heel toe strikes. Heel and the foot are changing from and very periodic. Yeah, I, I personally I have haven't have some data on that. Yeah, I, I personally haven't tried walking, but I, I I'm not I'm sure it should work, but it's it's, it's hard to say without trying. I, I would add I mean these style of models have definitely been used for walking and vocal motion. I am sure uh, because we did that, yeah. yes. And Zex group does a really amazing like locomotion work I mentioned earlier. They have done some really cool walking. Okay. So sorry, sorry. Oh yeah, no. Thank you for the question. I want to give a quite simple uh, figure first to explain sort of the capabilities of the approach. Here you can see a cart wall. There are soft walls on the sides. This is really a toy example. So uh, if you look at the table on the bottom right. You would see there are things called CE and CP. CE corresponds to contact event, which means there's actual contact. And CP corresponds to the area where our contact model predicts contact. So for example, if you examine the yellow region, this would imply that there is no real contact event, but our contact model is predicting contact. I know you can see that the gradient of our residual we are learning is changing even when there is no contact event in this yellow region, right? Only time we don't have gradient updates is the case where there is no contact events and there is no contact prediction by our model, which means things are aligning. In all the other regions, our model is constantly updating. That's, that's what I wanted to emphasize here, that you don't necessarily even need contact events to actual contact to learn things. And I'm now going to move towards some of the hardware results. This is the same example where with the ball. Here now we are running our online residual learning module. You can see it already starts touching the ball after two, three trials. And after like, let's say four, four trials, it, it starts like actually accomplishing the task. And for this case, it can reliably achieve this. And the next one is we tried some uh, objects with uh, non-small surfaces, weird surface uh, geometries like oranges and lime here. You can see that uh, the controllers uh, on the go can adapt to this kind of changes. I want to emphasize that uh, this this sort of had a success rate around like 50, 60 percent, maybe it wasn't like 100 percent success rate for these cases because the geometry is really weird and it can really roll weirdly. But uh, we got some interesting results using also the objects which are not even spherical. But oh, and one thing I forgot to mention is we initialize the model of these as a complete sphere by the way. It's learning these bumps on the when it's like a running algorithm. But are the bumps the main issue, or is it just that the center of gravity is somewhere off the center of the yeah. geometric center? Isn't that the main point, when, main difficulty when I look at the video here? So, so definitely that's one thing. Then, and also a framework is capable of learning that. But also that sometimes, let's say, like if the shape is more ellipsoid from one configuration, the distance to touch should be could be much shorter than the other side. If that makes sense because the shape is not uniform like a sphere. And we are working, in this case, we are working of a spherical based model. In some configurations of the fruit, actually, your, your gap functions are smaller and in some they are bigger. If that makes sense. That's also the other cause of uh, problem in this case. Okay, so the next topic I wanna focus on is uh, how can we get uh, probably stabilizing tactile feedback controllers? So I want to show a really nice uh, experiment here. Uh, you can see that uh, on the left side, 
there's a someone is lighting a match, and on the right side they are doing the same thing, but an aesthetic is applied to their fingers. And you can see without the tactile information how much they are struggling in the setting. Like you, we can actually see this. I I, I find this a really compelling video of showing the importance of the tactile feedback here. And it, they do it at the end, so it's not impossible to do it, but it takes a lot of time. And other thing I want to emphasize here is that tactile sensors have been really like evolving rapidly in the last years. There are really, really impressive tactile sensors now. The hardware is getting there. So one the question is that like we know this tactile feedback, tactile information is important, and we know that we have the data, the hardware now to get this data. What can we do with it, right? Is a really important question to answer. So I want to again take a step back so, and uh, talk about a little bit about hybrid state feedback design. Uh, and I would relate this to the tactile feedback models. So here, the one thing that's uh, one type of uh, models people, ex state feedback controllers people explored was this sort of U equals KIX, right? Here's a you're assigning a different policy KI for each part of the state. And the state are just like denoted as like this blue, green, and red in this case, right? And there are impressive works by Mikhail Johnson and Anders Ranser from 2000s. They have multiple works, actually. And uh, Manfred uh, and Domenico Mignone have uh, analyzed the same setting in the discrete time. The first one is more on the continuous time regime. And these works uh, give, at the end of the day, hybrid, provably stable controllers. But none of these actually use the tactile information in this setting. right? They are just based on pure state feedback. And these are combinatorial controllers. And what I mean by that is, I intentionally made this figure a bit like hectic and bad looking, but you can see for every interaction of the contact modes and every vision, you, this controller is going to assign a different uh, policy. And this is going to scale exponentially with the number of the colors here, which are number of contacts. But important thing is they have uh, stability guarantees, right? Even though they don't use tactile feedback. The, on the other hand, the tactile feedback controllers out there uh, usually rely on static assumptions. So this could be something like grasping, right? And it's like in this kind of slow regime. They usually require mode detection, which means first you get some data and then you decide which mode, which, which section of the partitioning you are in, which mode you are in, and then you pick the switch and controller. Most, so hence, these are most of them are hybrid strategies. And another important thing to note here is that none of the previous tactile feedback controllers has done stability analysis in terms of the upper specifically in this setting. So to sort of uh, get the both of, both of best worlds and uh, design like good tactile feedback controllers, our approach, our approach is a really simple, super easy to implement approach. It combines this tactile state feedback with uh, term and lambda term here, which is the contact measurement. This lambda here is basically the analog measurement you get from your tactile sensor, right? You can just uh, straightforwardly dump that information into your controller. And I will uh, show that our algorithm can work for reactive problems. It doesn't need to be necessarily a static problem. It can work with the dynamic reactive problems. It doesn't need any mode detection, which means that you can just get the tactile sensor information and use it in your controller. The third one is that it's still a hybrid strategy, which is, again, important to emphasize here what I mean by that. So in the no contact regime, your, control, your lambda, the contact force is zero, there's no measurement, and your controller is just a regular state feedback controller. When the green contact is active, you get this additional green term. When, let's say, blue and red are active, you get other, other like blue term and the red term, right? So the idea here is that this is hybrid because the tactile sensor, the contact, actually carries part part of the problem. It carries all this multimodal hybrid information. That's why, even though you just like dump it simply in your controller, it is still hybrid and switching, right? because it's really privileged and important information. And uh, late, lastly, I will show that how can you do probably stabilizing controller design using this type of controllers. And let me jump into that part. To do probable design, we, in this case, we will focus on Lyapunov-based design. And our Lyapunov function is uh, from this nice work by Kanat Chamlebel from 2006. You can see, like, unlike regular Lyapunov function, uh, this, this Lyapunov function also has contact forces in it. So basically, the open function is a quadratic function of the contact force and state in this case. And you can see the same analogy holds. Depending on which contact, contact is active, this controller actually switches, right, also. And also, another important thing to note here is like you can combine this with this local hybrid models, LCS models. And using this uh, uh, idea, you can actually get stability guarantees in this setting. 
by solving this optimization problem shown in blue. So the, in the blue, what I am doing is I am solving this optimization, finding a stability guarantee V, the Lyapunov function, and I input U, which, is, which are gains K and X, uh, verifying that the Lyapunov function is uh, always positive and its derivative is always decreasing on the sets which hold, where the contact force hold, holds, basically, on some semi-algebraic sets. An important thing to note here is in this optimization problem, you cannot see any mode enumeration. You cannot see any mode I. But uh, you might ask, how are you capturing this hybrid information? We, we are showing this Lyapunov statements over some semi-algebraic sets here, as I described. These are the feasible contact configurations, basically, if that makes sense. These are the feasible sets of contacts and uh, states. So, uh, so we have some complexity with the number of contacts. Yeah, please go May on. I suggest there is a wonderful review mm -hmm. for the last 50 years mm -hmm. of everything that was done in Bakhtar. Okay. By, I think, I'm not mispronounced, I think his name is B I C C I or C C I. He's from Pisa. Vicky. Vicky. Antonio Vicky. Antonio oh, uh -huh. Vicky. It's a wonderful review paper, and you should look at it. I will check that. Yeah, definitely. because he talks about control uh -huh. and everything else. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. So, uh, so the idea here is that uh, this is a hybrid feedback design without any sort of mode enumeration, as you can see. But there is some hidden complexity here I didn't, I kind of glossed over, is if you did regular hybrid-based design, what you would get would be a sort of exponential complexity with the number of contacts. Here we have some quadratic complexity with the number of contacts because we are encoding this information via a procedure called S procedure, and it still has some sort of quadratic scaling here. And I want to show some of the experiments we did with this method. So here, this is a really nice uh, and fun system we designed with uh, field. Yeah, you can see it's a card pole. The pole can interact with the soft walls. And there are uh, load cells under the walls, which are measuring the tactile information here. And what, one thing we did was, we tried Alcure on this first, right? What we did was we start the card from one side, bashed it into the other wall, and just use the Alcure policy, which is unaware of the contact events. It's just based off linearization. Here, we just mentioned the gain kx. And then we got this gain. Even though we didn't need to do this in our controller design, when we are finding our Lyapunov function and gains k and l, we fixed the k to be the same as the LQR case. And we, found, we just found a gain matrix l here, the contact gain, right? And repeated the same experiment multiple times, actually. And I, uh, I was actually surprised that this happened to work this well, is that consistently our policy was stabilizing and LQR was failing in this case, as you can see. And the contact event is less than 50 milliseconds in this case, which is also a pretty short and it's interesting. This, the fact that it's, it matters is interesting. Here you can see two different uh, plots here during the impact event, during this 50 millisecond window. The blue is showing our approach and the red is the IQR. You can see when impact starts, our controller suddenly starts like applying uh, force towards other side, right side, to save, save from the contact event reactively. And IQR is, of course, not really uh, aware of the information. And you can even see that our controller mitigates some of the contact event due to that. OK, so I want to also mention, uh, I talk a bit about frictional contact at the start of the talk. I also want to connect how we can uh, add frictional contacts, uh, deal with frictional contact in this framework. Here, you could see that uh, if there's frictional contact, let's say this four leg table, when you're pushing, pulling it on the ground, it, it really goes like this in an abrupt phase, right? It's, it's pretty hectic because of some non uniqueness uh, of the solution here. And these type of problems usually are represented by inclusions. And what I'm trying to get at is that this lambda in this case, the contact force is usually non unique in, in, in many of the frictional contact cases. And what happens as a result of this is the controller we propose and the Lyapunov function we worked with, because this lambda is now multi valued, these also become multi valued, right? Because you are directly mapping lambda to these functions using lambda in these functions. Because lambda is multivalued, these are also multivalued. And what you can do in this case is uh, one thing that there's a really powerful result by Shen from 2005. They uh, actually shown that if you can find the gain W such that W times this contact uh, solution set is a singleton, then you get this nice matrix actually, the, uh, nice, uh, nice function that is continuous and piecewise linear, right? Which means that uh, actually it's more than continuous piecewise linear, it's actually over polyhedra, so it's globally lift sheets also. And what we have done in this case is that uh, we designed an algorithm for this setting where you can all, uh, find this max rank W almost surely. So we, in the, in the work, 
we in the thesis we present an algorithm where you can use it to find this max and w. And then after you find this w, you can actually this is a straightforward but important uh, step. You can parameterize your policy and the Lyapunov function as a unique uh, function, right? Uh, not a multi but a regular function here. Because you are using this like W lambda terms, now you get rid of this like non-uniqueness problem. And uh, what you get is like a really well-behaved Lipschitz continuous controller, for example, in this case. OK, so uh, I want to jump into the last topic where uh, we have some learning-based controllers and we want to do stability verification on systems like this. So the setting here is the following. Uh, there are many learning-based controllers, and they are really working better and better lately, right? But sometimes uh, we want to have sort of some stability and safety guarantees for a proxy of performance in real life for such systems. So th in this part, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I will try to like sort of make a push in that direction. The problem we will uh, focus on in this part of the talk will be the following. So this is, again, your local hybrid system. Instead of the controller U, I put a neural network now. This phi NN is a neural network controller. And I will focus on uh, pro uh, propose a framework that you can, where you can analyze the stability of this closed-loop system, right? OK, so it, it's, it's, it's really a procedural method. The first uh, thing I want to describe is this nice uh, demo by Hamels, again, is that the value activation functions are equivalent to a SCP. So these two problems, you can think of them as equivalent to each other. And what we have done uh, is that using this uh, property, we have shown that for any real neural network, you can actually write it as an SCP. So in a sort of a framework that's more uh, uh, familiar to the multi-contact domain, right? And important thing here is the following. So uh, we know that both of these are piecewise affine structures. So it's not surprising that you can convert one to the other. But if you had a real neural network, and if you wanted to convert it into a, let's say, a piecewise affine function, this is not a trivial task. But in this, in actually, in this theorem we propose in the paper, we show that in this setting, this is really easy to convert. It's just you can do it by even pen and paper, by just concatenating vectors and matrices. And similarly, what you can do after, after this step is the left hand side is the uh, same system from before. I denoted by lambda s the hybrid uh, the components of lambda, which are with the hybrids related to hybrid system. You can do this lifting. You can write your neural network as a SCP. What you get is a one bit LCS, as you can see on the right hand side. And here, what we are doing is the, we are exploiting sort of this additive structure of the uh, LCS, the hybrid formulation. And we are sort of getting this nice lifted single LCS system. And after you get this, the powerful thing is you can use any result in the LCS literature to provide stability guarantees or to analyze the system, right? So the framework works as the following. You start with a neural network policy. You convert it into an SCP first, right, using the, uh, using the term from the paper. And then you can do this lifting. So your whole system is now a single hybrid LCS system. And then you can do stability verification, mostly in terms of LMIs. But I want to highlight, you could also do pick any method from the CS literature. It could be some passivity-based method, for example, and do the analysis again after this. And I want to talk about the sort of the results here and the important, important points. On the top side, you can see some of the level sets, for example, and the region of attraction using, using this method. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, set and Lyapunov trajectories. So I want to emphasize a few things. One of them is the framework is totally agnostic to the structure of the neural network. It just scales uh, linearly with the number of neurons. So it doesn't really matter if you have a deep neural network or long neural network, like a, I, I, it's like bit. I forgot the term, I guess. But it doesn't really depend on the structure of your neural network. Second one is that it really works with models with non unique solutions. It doesn't really need to be like a piecewise affine model or a mixed integer program type of model. It can work with any type of uh, model with non unique solutions. And if you also have like nonlinear dynamics, neural network dynamics, sorry, not nonlinear, and neural network controllers, you can also use this method to provide stability. And I also want to uh, emphasize that uh, on the table here to talk about the scalability. So for the piecewise quadratic Lyapunov function design uh, approach, we have made it scale up to like 100 number of neurons, so uh, which which is Ramos the limiting factor here. Uh, for a, if you use a piecewise, uh, sorry, just a quadratic Lyapunov function, we can go up to like 140 or 150 neurons 
roughly. Right. So for the piecewise quadratic Lyapunov function, we can give stability up to like 100 neurons. 100? Neurons in your neural network. For the piecewise, for the quadratic, it just goes up to about 50 or something. So it's pretty under the limits of the actual deep networks nowadays. Yeah, so it's still way to go there. You said it very fast. Oh, apologies. I couldn't understand. Yeah. I, I sometimes tend to talk fast. But yeah, apologize for that. So uh, so for the to give like a quick summary of the work, I presented the planning framework, uh, like a real-time MPC framework. I talked about how we can deal with tactile information in a reactive, combinatorial, and probably stable manner. And I also talked about uh, how you can do stability verification when you have this learning-based controllers. Now I want to talk about the weaknesses of the work and sort of potential future directions. By the way, I really like this uh, uh, video because you can see this almost state amazing. of the art. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's like state of auto art locomotion and manipulation, I would say. Like, <laughs> it even has like oranges in its uh, legs, by the way. I don't know if you notice like the foot. Uh, there are even oranges there. So, like, uh, but uh, I just like put a sort of like a brief and like to see like how impressive we can get so far. But what, one big weakness of this talk is like I, I pitched uh, during the talk that uh, importance of this using this local hybrid models, right? But still there is this term local there. So these are still uh, sort of local models. There are some global planning problems where these models will struggle, right? And currently actually we are working with some of my lab mates to sort of uh, attack this issue. But uh, it's important to note that like locality is still there to some degree. Even though you can make decisions of making and breaking contact, you cannot make every global decision. The other, other part is computational challenges. So uh, the current methods maybe scale up to if you have, let's say, three objects or four objects. But if you start having like 10 oranges, like now the pro methods proposed in this thesis are not going to be scalable anymore. And I think still there is a way to go for like pushing the computational limitations and getting faster and faster algorithms. Another important thing I want to highlight is rich contact interaction. So uh, again, maybe I haven't uh, really mentioned this truly, but this work mostly focused on point contact models. And it's still, I think, interesting to explore what happens if you have a really rich contact where like it's a surface con surface contact or uh, like you have a soft object, a deformable object, as I mentioned here, how would you deal with that when it's like this nasty infinite dimensional state space? How can I do control? How can I use that? Uh, information of the object and do still still achieve the task. And another uh, important thing, which is kind of a high, too high level, I guess, but something I want to mention, is that I think it's uh, really challenging to do control using high dimensional data, especially vision is well known in this regime, but also tactile data. Most of these tactile sensors are going to provide really high dimensional data, right? So I think doing control in this setting is, uh, people, have, people are working on this and it's not something I'm extremely knowledgeable in, to be fair. But I think it's an interesting area where like, there's a lot of future uh, development possible. All right. So I would like to end with some acknowledgments. I would like to thank my advisor, Michael. He has been really great over the last years and has been really helpful like, um, towards uh, teaching me about how to do research. And it's, well, it was enjoyable to collaborate with him as a, in many of the projects. I also would like to thank uh, Manfred Mori, who's both in my committee and who was both a collaborator in many of my works. Um, he was really, really extremely helpful during my PhD. I had really good advice from him. Uh, I really like, I really want to say I really appreciate that. He always had time. He always had like really critical and useful advice. I also want to thank like uh, people I collaborated with here, like uh, the postdocs, the Mahia, Ranshin, Victor, Victor is a professor, Cassiano. And uh, I also want to thank uh, some of my lab mates who, who Adam did an internship here, did amazing work. Wei Chang is the work I did this residual learning with. Matt and Vivit, that Vivit we are currently working with. With Matt, we also work together. Shalanya, Philip, I thank everyone. Uh, basically, thank you so much. And uh, I also want to thank my committee members, of course, Zach and George. Uh, thank you for like um, spending time and giving really valuable feedback in this talk. Uh, I, I also want to talk my, some, I put like on the bottom line, I put some of my undergraduate advisors that I did research with. Uh, I, I would really like to thank all of them. I would especially want to thank Nesna Sarafchenger. She introduced me to hybrid systems and uh, she introduced me to like this spiking neurons, which were like this kind of the first exposure I had for like the hybrid uh, dynamics. And she also told me some, a bit about the bifurcation theory and it was really enjoyable. That's when I decided like I kind of wanted to do 
uh, research, and I'm really thankful for that. And all, of course, all our lab members, um, some of them are here, most of them are here. I'm really thankful. And uh, lastly, I will sort of cut it short with friends and family, just like mentioning the brief mention, but uh, you folks know that your support is really important to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for all my friends and all my family. Yep. And I think I will conclude here. You didn't show your dog. There was a dog on the original slides. I cannot hear anything anymore. <laughs> Sorry, no sound. Oh, is there no sound right now? Yeah, yes, now. Uh, maybe maybe you're not saying anything. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Speechless. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arp. Uh, we now go to the question period, and I'll start with the committee. And let me start with the external member, Zach, uh, first, and then go to George afterwards. Zach, do you want to start with some questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, is the is it sort of a one question and go around multiple times, no. or should I just kind of go? Okay. I think you should just go, and if you go too long, I'll interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, thanks for the nice talk, Alp. This is fun. Um, it's obviously a topic that's very close to my heart, so I, it's always good to see uh, other people taking different approaches to this kind of stuff. Um, let's see, where should we start? Um, okay, one maybe one good sort of high level place to start. Um, if you could kind of maybe go back towards the the sort of contact aware LQR kind of stuff, I wanted to pick a little bit on the maybe the hardware demo you had with the inverted pendulum. Yeah, this. So um, you mentioned at some point in here that, um, you know, you kind of emphasize that the, yeah, it's that top line there, that they're only different during this 50 millisecond impact time. And um, uh, so I guess one sort of other way to look at this is that the impact time is super short. And in fact, here, it's probably a bit longer because you're using a soft material there that's deformable. Yes. If you replaced the walls there with a hard surface, like with the metal or something like this, um, and you know the impact time would potentially be even shorter, especially if you're talking about um, plastic impacts and it's bouncing off. Um, mm -hmm. So one question I have here then is, um, how does this impact you know things like the um, the sampling rate on your controller? And um, are there situations here in which you start to run into, um, you know, like needing, well, it, it seems like in a lot of these cases, uh, one of the core issues with all of this stuff is that you have very, very fast switching. And mm -hmm. um, here you're uh, you're potentially bouncing off the wall and then sort of how does that play? You know, if, if the contact force is happening, if your Lambda is only active for a really, really short amount of time, mm -hmm. um, can you, you know, at some point, can you even run the sample rate on the controller fast enough to capture that? And you know, just general thoughts on this and sample rates and maybe things like you know Nyquist. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. So by the way, apologize. The system here is not super robust. I heard ninety percent of your question, but not hundred. <laughs> uh, like please, like interrupt me if I'm uh, going in the wrong direction. So the the first part of the question you ask about what if you had like a harder contact surfaces. So one thing that's this is like a really important question and something I probably should have already mentioned this. This is for, this work only is considers like soft contact models. If you have rigid contacts that are, let's say, impulsive, it's really hard to think how would you apply them to like this setting where you have this uh, L times lambda term, where lambda is now like let's say impulsive force. So in that setting, like we really restrict ourselves to soft contact regime. But what I have done is uh, in the experiments I've done, this is in simulation, not in hardware. I have tried chunking up the const spring constants, make them stiffer and stiffer, and you can get decent sim simulation results by, uh, like it, it can work for like stiff systems. I'm talking about like K being thousands or 10,000 maybe. I, I don't double check my code, it's been like three, four years, but thousands for sure, 10,000 may maybe. I don't exactly remember how much I pushed it. But around around that regime, so it's stiff, stiff uh, spring regime, this control still can work. If we move this to hardware, what you said is really important, like the sampling rates are gonna be now a big factor. Like uh, it's gonna, it's going to be important now, like how fast your controller is getting the data and how fast it's running. 
So in that case, I didn't try, so I cannot really tell you what you would do there. But my thinking is, I think this work is probably pushable into some sort of a rigid, more rigid regime. But I think some work needs to be done. I don't think it will directly relate. But, uh, does this answer your question? Or uh, yeah, yeah, this is all good. I might, I might poke at this a little bit more. So you know, you you mentioned a few times, you know, Imo Todorov's uh, line of work, um, and I think his general, and I've heard him say things along these lines. It, philosophically, he kind of argues that the world is really soft and uh, everything's approximate and the uh, soft contact models are easier to work with. Um, and so, you know, I'm just going to want to hear your take on this argument. Uh, you're spending a lot of time on these hybrid models, but here you're kind of explicitly saying that this thing's got to be soft for this to work. At some point, um, I guess, what's your general thought on like the utility of, of these hybrid models, so-called hard contact models versus these more soft, approximate, or smoothed contact models? Like, yeah, you know, so, so there, is, there is two types. Oh, sorry, did I interrupt the last part? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Okay. So the, to me, there are two, two different soft, when you say soft, there are two different things. So in this case, this is still not smooth, right? There is no contact forces when there is no touching. So that's one soft in my mind. The other soft is, you actually smoothen the model so you can get some information even when there's no contact. And I think, I mean, I've seen good results with both approaches. Sometimes I know that the second one where you smoothen and you have some contact forces when there's no contact could cause trouble when you're too far away from the object, for example, right? We have known this like because it decays. So in the case where, let's say, if you're in a regime like this, uh, approximation like this one could be more helpful. But uh, my point is, I think these are really hard problems and I'm, I'm not really, too opinionate about which model is better. I think both of them have values in different settings. But I, I just wanted to also distinguish like sort of this softness of like yeah. what, what is what soft here is like versus what soft in MO's work, for example, usually mostly is like uh, you have some contact without touching, right? You you had exactly the response I wanted to hear, actually. This uh, distinction of, you know, this is still sort of uh, has switching discontinuity, but the it's soft after you make contact, but there's no force at a distance distinction is exactly the one that I always bring up with uh, as the counter to sort of the emo Todorov uh, approaches to these things. So excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see, what else should we talk about then? Um, okay, so one one other thing that um, sort of occurred to me. Um, so yeah, the, the work that here that was new to me that I hadn't seen before from like your previous uh, talks that I've seen was the adaptive stuff. And so I wanted to ask a couple of things there. One was just a clarification question. It looked like you were regressing basically just a, an affine term in the model, like this X, is that really just a constant term that you're adding yes. on? Okay, and you're just trying to do this fast online and, and that's it. Yes, yeah, so so ju just a few uh, elaboration on that is, we actually can learn all of these, like you can add this just to all A, B, all, all the methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. We just had good performance by adding the constants, so we just didn't move towards like the more complicated setting. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is sort of a time varying term added to yeah, the- cool. Yeah, cool. Totally. I mean, this is very much the sort of classic uh, linear MPC approach uh, to yes. these sort of things too, right? It's sort of the MPC equivalent of having integral feedback in some sense, right? So this all kind of makes sense. Um, so uh, one th then, yeah, just that was a clarification for me. Um, I was then wondering if you had thought about, you know, there's a very rich sort of history of an adaptive control of essentially um, using Lyapunov type approaches to um, try to prove joint convergence of like the parameter estimates and the state, you know, under the, the controller. Have you thought at all about what something like this might look like in this context, like this res residual learning stuff? Um, can you... Uh, sort of mash something like this together with any of your um, Lyapunov approaches to try to um, say anything concrete about what happens online? So, yeah, great question again. And um, so I'm not extremely like, by the way, just to be clear on this, I just like got into adaptive control lately doing this project. I'm not an expert on this area, but I would like to give my thought on this. So most of the methods, I, I kind of skim like the methods that people use in adaptive control. They usually parameterize their like sort of parameter updates in a, with some nice rules. Here, like our, our, our update is really kind of this nasty optimization problem. We, we solve one quadratic program to do this first, and then we do this gradient update. So I think one big, one challenge there potentially would be like, uh, because we also have an optimization problem being solved in the update itself. 
unlike some of the control where people actually have some update rules, right? Clear the rhythm down, down. That will be the challenging part, but people have been showing like sort of, I know that what George and Manfred has works with like Mahyar, one of my collaborators who had this like analyzing sort of convergence of optimization algorithms. So maybe there's a actually way there to like sort of push even like adding this optimization being solved into the structure and like getting some sort of stability guarantees, but it's kind of a big, I guess a big uh, statement by me, which is not backed necessarily super well up, but yeah, these are my thoughts. I, I would say I'm not extremely familiar with this, yeah. I, okay, I didn't think no, that's okay. Um, let's see then what else do I have? Um, okay, one, maybe I have like two more small ones. One, then the other one I was kind of curious about, the um, the neural net verification stuff, specifically, you know, kind of thinking about scalability of these problems. Um, I mean, these are classically, you know, super hard things to scale up in general, right? Like whether it's sauce verification or, you know, uh, yes. mil milps for trying to verify these sorts of ReLU things. Um, so like uh, this number of neurons, this is the full, you know, dynamics plus controller joint thing all put together. That's that's kind of it. Sorry, can you repeat the last sentence because the, your voice kind of lost. About yeah, sorry. The number of neurons in your table here, this is the full closed loop system with the neural net dynamics and controller put together. It's sort of upper bounded at about 100 neurons. Yes. So our, our system, you can think of it as like a, and states 500 mode system plus 100 in this case, I guess. Plus 100 neurons. Okay. This is the number of neurons in your controller, yes. Okay, so this is the controller specifically. This is just controller, um, yes. Gotcha. I mean, still quite small, but you know, okay, this, that's, yes. that's good to know. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, so A, what sort of solver were you using for this? And B, just kind of general thoughts on like um, where there might be scaling opportunities here. And if you think this is actually ever going to be practical. So, I, I mean, I would say from this region where we're at, it looks hard to make this practical, to be fair. Mm -hmm. There are some scaling opportunities. This was a, actually a code I made it in MATLAB, which is not super well optimized. I think some decent optimization will get this up to a reasonable level. I, but sorry, I shouldn't say reasonable. Let's say like probably to 200s, but I don't think we will scale ever up to thousands. And there is also like one other thing that's maybe important to mention is the we use sort of this like, uh, I, I believe we use Mosaic to solve these problems. And actually, if you move towards more like, let's say, operator splitting type of approaches, you can wait more, but you will not hit the memory limit, hopefully. So like, there's also some like, here, what I'm representing is like the memory limit, if you make that makes mm -hmm. sense. There are yeah. optimization approaches where you could wait much longer, but not hit the memory limit. I haven't really tried that because the reason uh, we kind of stopped was like, as you also recognize, and I totally agree with you, Compared to practical setting, this is really too small. To, to, uh, the gap seems too large. That I completely agree with you. But uh, but we thought a little bit about like how to make this more scalable. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. And then maybe lastly, I'll just ask like a bit of a philosophical question that came to mind in the very beginning when you showed these. You know, these. Uh, you kind of talked about how a lot of the work's been in locomotion, and, and you know, there's been relatively less work maybe in some of the manipulation tasks. And just looking at a lot of the examples you had throughout, I was wondering like at a high level, whether you think the the harder part here is actually the control or the sensing. Cause you also talked a bit about sensing and tactile sensing throughout. And, and you mentioned at the end, kind of, you know, the high dimensionality of a lot of the sensing modalities that we might think about using both vision and tactile. Um, and I think, you know, personally, you know, for me, it seems like if, if we had, access to you know all the information we could want in like a simulator maybe the control part there's obviously challenges here but maybe that part we could figure out but uh dealing with the messiness of the real world and the fact that these sensor modalities are you know maybe very very high dimensional uh maybe the sensor part is harder actually than the control part i'm wondering what you think about this yeah so i think i think it's a good and fair point uh, my thinking is that so I think control part, one thing that we see a lot in locomotion policies, which I know your group's paper doesn't do this, but so there is a group groups, uh, there's a group of people which unreasonably so make sort of a, a pretty remote schedules, right? Because you know, when you're walking, the gating is sort of almost decided, right? So mm -hmm. that type of problems, I would say control wise, a little bit on the easier side, like mode scheduling wise, right? There is that aspect. Uh, there is work like your group does to completely can adapt on the go, right? That's different. And then if you think more about like sort of the sensors and hardware, right? I will also add hardware in the loop that we mentioned. Manipulation side, I mean, let's say if you think about hands, robotic hands, for example, 
We don't really have necessarily good hardware. The tactile sensors are just getting there yet recently, right? So I agree with you that some part of the lack of progress is, I think, because of the hardware assessment. But I still also think that the controller part, uh, controller side of things, because we are not now adding this sort of assumptions of like any sort of gating patterns or like some something that we know about, let's say, locomotion, which you can easily adapt. I think the controller side is also a little bit more tricky in my perspective, but I think both are hard problems to be fair. Like I gave kind of a circular answer, I apologize, but yeah, this is kind of my tips. That's okay. Um, sorry, maybe this, this made me think of one last thing that I, I was thinking about. Um, in some of the, so you, you had a lot of kind of manipulation flavored examples and maybe like the manipulator rolling the ball. I'm wondering, um, you know, I think in a lot of the manipulation cases, um, things are not all that dynamic and we can get away with. And in fact, people have had a lot of success with quasi static models for a lot of these things. Um, any thoughts on how your sort of general set of approaches, uh, would apply there or if, or generally what you think about, you know, the, the trade-offs there. So, uh, I, I would actually say this, let me just briefly think, well, I think all of us, all of our approaches, you can model as quasi static and we will actually gain benefits in terms of the problem size is going to reduce in half, right? The states, which is a big thing. Uh, and if there's a problem which you could make the quasi static assumption, I would say definitely we should make it. Because it's going to make our problem easier. Same methods will apply, and we can get get away with also slower control rates. Basically, it's like sort of a great, great uh, assumption, and it will directly work in this kind of line of work. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, I'll pass the torch. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, George. Thanks. Thanks. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, just. Zach asked all the questions I had. So um, let's go to spin slide 34. All right. um, so you're saying uh, this is the non smoothly optimal function. Can you tell me a little bit more about is this using non smooth calculus or uh, non smooth derivatives? So, or is it a different notion of stability? Where's the notion of stability, you know, uh, or, and the non smoothness? So the, the original uh, analysis is from Chamlevan 2006. There they are making actually, they are using uh, sort of these directional derivatives mm -hmm. uh, to, make, to make their uh, proofs. In our work actually, we kind of change this a little bit. We kind of uh, uh, made sure that lambda is almost ever differentiable. That was the assumption we had in our work. Mm -hmm. So we, in that case, you don't really necessarily need to think about this directional derivative deeply anymore. You can have some cost points, but you can get away by assuming it's differential almost everywhere. And the analysis of the Lyapunov statement is almost the same as the sort of the regular Lyapunov statements. Because of, and let me just tell you why that is. So because our x of t, the, the, the solution we have, x of t, we assume it's absolutely continuous here. We don't deal with impulsive impacts. And because this function is going to be Lipschitz in terms of x, because of the, some of the results, you can actually write this lambda in terms of a, uh, in terms of x, and it becomes this Lipschitz function of x. Uh, like a good analogy would be, you can think of lambda as a piecewise affine function of x in this case, and piecewise affine functions are global Lipschitz. So this v becomes a Lipschitz function of x, and if you compose this with an absolutely continuous x, this whole uh, Lyapunov function it becomes absolutely continuous in t. And after you get this statement, everything, every general Lyapunov statement applies after that point. So what we do is kind of some assum some uh, hard assumptioning on our systems to make kind of almost convert it to regular Lyapunov statements. Under the hood. But I think, like, the, uh, I gave, sorry, like a slightly maybe unclear answer, but I think maybe the key point here will be to think of a lambda as a function of x, a Lipschitz continuous function of x, a globally Lipschitz piecewise affine function of x. That would, I think, make things maybe potentially more. Then you could even, like, almost reason this is similar to what Rand said, for example, in 2000, to some degree, uh, the Lyapunov statement proves. Yeah. It's a one Lyapunov function, non smooth system. But has absolutely continuous solutions. It has absolutely continuous solutions. So essentially, like the absolute continuity comes comes like like uh, we know we know the solutions of this system are absolutely continuous because like the 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 the, the way we model like the, this assumption actually I'm kind of this assumption here you see this W times the solution set we also have this in our dynamics. So uh, long story short, essentially our dynamics are also Lipschitz. Which again, you can use uh, theorems from Khalil's book even. Mm -hmm. That's what like the authors in this LCS papers do mostly is that you can just use the theorem from Khalil showing that this is like a, is a continuous solution or a unique solution in this case. Right? Mm -hmm. To 
push it to my unique, there is some more tricks, but I think it's like the sort of a corner case, which I don't focus too much. Can you explain to me, since you're on uh -huh. the W matrix? So, uh -huh. <laughs> after this, like, like the W matrix. So what, what, yeah. the, what W is? Yes, I didn't, I, I think I got it, uh -huh. but I, I am not a So essentially the, the solution is the, given a state configuration, mm -hmm. I feel that we really may be right with the text there, you get a bunch of lambda, the solution is a set. And you basically want to find the W that maps all of these sets to like a singleton. That set the points to a singleton. Basically, it's like this kind of nice subspace, maybe you can think of it, right? That is it. Okay. And I guess my philosophical question is you started talking about local, and mm -hmm. I know it's the future direction, but mm -hmm. how local is local? Yes. There's been a lot of work on trying to get, you know, let's say nonlinear and to some extent hybrid systems and trying to do piecewise and find approximations of it. You know, so how how is that affecting your modeling? So I mean, how, how local is local is a really good point. Uh, that's like sort of. Uh, but I, what I, has I, been the guideline even mm -hmm. in your experiments? Yes, uh, yes, yeah, that that would be a start. So so I, I would say when I say local here, I mean you can reason about nearby contact events to some okay. degree. Oh, okay. So this hybrid like LCS models is something you can use to sort of say, okay, I can go in this direction and I will touch this table. And you have a rough idea of like how the direction is going to work. Mm -hmm. If you just made one local model, then actually you cannot do this if you just want linearization. Another point is like uh, earlier in my PhD, I sort of worked on this like representing nonlinear systems with piecewise. Mm -hmm. That I think is not like, I think that's like really hard. Like essentially, if I have something nonlinear, I would never convert it to hybrid intuitively, is my like what I kind of think right now. If you start with something really complicated and nonlinear, I will never like go from that to hybrid. But in this case, we have something nonlinear and hybrid. And we are going from nonlinear and hybrid to linear and hybrid to be like sort of tractable. That makes sense. That to me makes sense. So in that case, do you take the nonlinear and hybrid and keep the hybrid switching part intact and then just linearize the exactly. nonlinear? The exactly. Nonlinear. Exactly. You, you just don't generate new discontinuities in that process. You, you linearize the switching surfaces to some extent. So, so okay, you should, okay, you do that as well. Okay. Yes, you essentially like. Okay, you keep the structure the same. Yes, the non small structure keeps the same. any nonlinear function, yes. whether it's the switching side or the nonlinear dynamics gets translated. It can definitely affect the switching boundaries, of course, but if you, if you think like, a, because we are also linearizing the switching functions, I know. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, that's probably the hard part. It is a hard part. Yes, the limitation of the guards, that you can't reason about pushing an object from the left and the right. Mm -hmm. So, single. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have done some like analysis on like how our linearizations look. So under some assumptions, they actually are good models in the sense of like, you can show if it converges, the global nonlinear system also converges, mm -hmm. but under some sort of strict assumptions. Okay. So like you need boundedness and not every example I showed here holds for that. Uh, yeah, like, so I, I, I would say we sort, we sort of like didn't analyze the local systems like insanely <laughs> way, not the theoretically, the properties, but yeah, basically that's what we do. Okay. And there's I think that's all yeah. that good. All right. Almost done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, George. Thank, thank you, George. Um, Mike, do you want to ask some question, Michael? Uh, I, I only had one question came up. I mean, I've seen this all a bunch. Um, you, you made this comment about the, the last part, the scalability not depending on the neural network structure. Mm -hmm. Do you really think that's true? I, I would think that structure in the neural network would lead to sparsity in the STP, which, you know. I mean, um, we haven't really explored the sparsity, but it's possible maybe to like sort of explore some, like uh, explore some sort of sparsity patterns. I cannot easily see a way. But I, I would think that neural network structure could lead, would lead to sparsity patterns in the resulting LCP. Is that is that true or not true? Sorry, can I say it again? No. The structure of the neural network, whether it's wide and deep or shallow, um, you know, yes. uh, would uh, lead to sparsity patterns in the LCP. It will still lead to so like the there is one to one mapping between the complementary variables and the neurons. It's one to one always. This is this is this is sure, but the, the connections between those neurons, I'm guessing, leads to essentially off diagonal elements in the LCP matrix. I mean, this this will lead to like a sparse in your F matrix. Right. How does that translate to more scalability is unclear to me. Like it will lead to 
as far as in the apparatus, yes. I, I don't I don't actually know how would you how would you make it more scalable using that sparse thing. Thank you, Michael. Um, I just want to make one comment first, and I have a couple of questions. Um, George, you were a comment about the uh, approximation of nonlinear systems through piecewise affine systems, at least that's how I understood it. That was our first dream when we started working um, in hybrid systems. Basically, we felt there's no need for any nonlinear control theory anymore. It's all piecewise linear. As soon as we started doing any application, and this was power systems, we immediately got so many um, pieces uh, to give a reasonable representation of the nonlinear system that it became immediately hopeless in terms of the computations. So somewhere it catches up um, with you. But my, my question um, is maybe similar, um, Arp. Uh, at least in different areas where we came from, there has been a continuous discussion if we should uh, treat those problems in discrete time or continuous time, okay? And I wanted to ask you if you have an opinion on that because uh, some of the methods that you described obviously are clearly require discrete time description, otherwise not, uh, necessarily yeah so actually uh, I, I will answer the question but i will also start by saying this is uh, outside of my area of expertise there is uh, uh, matt in our lab matthew Hall, who was exploring sort of this continuous time uh, systems the uh, contact systems so like most of the works uh, most of the uh, let's say this manipulation side like mpc problems i've been focusing on we work on discrete time models where they're like here, like you don't really have impulses, their impulses are there resolved over some time window. So like, there are some differences between of course, continuous time and the discrete time in terms of contact systems, but it's unclear to me if like discrete time approximations are too bad. I think they are reasonable and uh, I've been getting like empirically some results with them. Yep. Sorry. Sorry, I meant more, I understand, I agree with everything you said, but I meant more in terms of the, computational challenges that you get oh so you know in the sense you can discrete that uh, time uh, then uh, you could essentially you have to assume at every time point there's a switch if you have continuous time you don't have to do that you just have to find the time where the switch occurs and it may be a more efficient representation that's what i had in mind so so for, for example, for the Lyapunov design work, like the tactile feedback design work, I actually, in that work, I don't see a big difference computational complexity wise for control, control wise, uh, design wise, between like discrete and continuous. At the end, we didn't really do the discrete time version of it, but I think it's, I personally think it's doable. It's just like a, it's a matter of playing around with matrices and figuring it out. In that setting, I don't think there's a big difference. In the, in the MPC line of work, then I guess you, how you discretize is really gonna matter, right? And I think, uh, it's hard for me to say anything about continuous time MPC in that framework, I guess. I'm not uh, super familiar with what people do in the continuous time regime with just MPC frameworks. But for Lyapunov function work, I think the complexity of control design would be similar for both cases, is my intuition. So, so with MPC, it's just, you know, in each case, you're solving a uh, nonlinear trajectory optimization problem, okay? So the, the question is if the continuous description of the system makes the problem easier, or if you want to discretize immediately, eventually you have to discretize. But I, obviously, I would argue that, right? this is a lot of what I did in my PhD that the continuous time description makes it harder for, for the content. Really? Uh, okay. A lot of the computational okay. benefits that you see in simulation come from the move to this these time stepping discrete time systems. Now, Zach has done something that, that skews more towards continuous time, so maybe he disagrees. But... Um, I would tend to agree with your assessment there. I would say, like we we tend okay, to, try I, to live in discrete time. I'm 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 interested. I will certainly follow up on this, um, uh, Michael, just to make sure that I um, that the, the, the type of systems are the, the same. They may be different. That may be the reason. Um, the, the other thing, um, 
I that I wanted to ask you. I mean, you have the sensor information uh, in in your work, and don't on this lambda there. Uh, don't you have um, some requirements on what information the sensor is giving you? Is there some you know that you don't get into some singular type of situation? Or it's uh, because you, you you make no assumptions on the sensor information. You just said we have the sensor and this this is what comes in. So that there's a certain there has to be a certain assumption what you need. So so essentially in this examples I've shown, we assume we have access to uh, all the sensors, the sensing information. Like if there's any contact force in our model, we have that information from our sensor. You don't necessarily need this. You can actually like easily enforce some sparsity patterns in your controller design. If you are not getting some of some sensor information, you can easily like do the design without using them, if that makes sense. That's also completely doable. We have actually done cases of this where on the state side, when you don't get some state information, you can still use your tactile measurements to do, do tasks. That's what we have shown in the paper, actually. And you can actually revert that idea and like do the same for sensing. So essentially, the answer would be, in short, we, in this examples I showed, we assume you have access to all the lambdas in your model, but you can actually assume that you don't have sensing for partial you can you can also assume you have partial sensing of them basically and the framework will still hold with minor changes okay Let's see if i had something else here i think much of it was um was oh yeah um we were uh, or you were talking before about the model uh types and um uh, Todorov's uh, claims, uh, etc. But at the end, you know the the type of model that you uh, want to use, at least in your context, I think depends on what problem you want to solve using that model. Yeah? And um, so, I think one of the references that you had said um, instead of using the switch system they did kind of a relaxation of the switching conditions and smoothing it and i was wondering what's your general opinion about that because in principle you could say your complementary the systems are smooth instead of product zero they can be product epsilon and you could even think about iterating starting with a large epsilon and uh, iterating to a small epsilon uh, it, it doesn't seem to have caught on, but from the how you um, describe your references, I think it was tried in the literature. So, so the last epsilon part, I couldn't really follow exactly, but I the complementary concern equals epsilon rather than equals zero. Oh, oh, that's actually, actually, oh, actually, Zach's group has actually directly, I think, examined this recently. The work I, I have cited here, uh, it's a really nice work by Taylor and uh, Simon. Sorry, I went to it. Ah, where was it? Here. The first work actually explores that uh, what's going to happen if you actually make some epsilon relaxation. And they show some impressive problems already, so I can straightforwardly tell you it, it, it can also work. For I think, like, personally, my thinking is uh, that, like, this is like a, this non convex, like, MP complete problem area where any sort of approach and algorithm has a value. And I think we should keep exploring both directions. Many, like, I think most of the works have. Uh, shown like really impressive performance on the particular problems. Probably we will never find a, a solution that applies to everything in this domain, but yeah, doing any sort of different type of method who has like a value, I think, in this kind of domain. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now I wanna ask again, the committee, do you have some further questions before I turn it over to the audience? I'm okay, I'm finished. George and Michael said, okay. On this side. And Zach, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Now I want to ask the audience, uh, maybe uh, first the audience on the web, if you want to ask some questions on Zoom. Does not seem to be the case in the audience in the room. Rujina, some more questions? Rujina left, my friend. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't see. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, then I want to close the official or the open part of the exam.